Indians of North America, like all the first peoples of the earth, rarely stayed long in one spot. So when the white man came, they had no cities to show him. They lived by hunting, and they had to travel constantly from place to place to follow the wild game. When they moved, they carry their families, their household goods, and even their houses, the Indian wigwams. Nothing was left behind. But it was a hard life, and some of the Indians discovered that they could be surer of their food supply by cultivating the soil. With gardens planted in terraces up the hillsides to catch and hold the moisture, the Indians of the Southwest discovered also that they had to stand guard over their crops and wait there for the harvest. To do this, they had to band together. So up in the protecting cliffs, they built permanent homes. These were the first cities in our country. They reached the heights by means of long ladders, some of them placed outside and some inside, up through holes in the different floors. In the daytime, cultivating their crops in the valley below. At night, going upstairs to their dwellings, high in the cliffs. If an enemy pressed them too hard, all they had to do was to pull up their ladders protected by stonework, and being high up, no enemy, such as they had, could very well reach them. Look downward and you can easily see how safe they really were. Building a village on a high hill was one of the earliest schemes of community defense. It was to be found in England and all over the world. But the people who lived on level ground, like the Hopis of the desert, had to build their high places, usually with sun-dried bricks. A high wall around the community was practically the same, because the idea was to make the enemy climb up before he could get at the people inside. This particular wall, is one which was used around the city in ancient China, where there was constant danger from invading armies. High up on the wall, protected by battlements, sentries were stationed to keep watch over the surrounding country, ready to spread an alarm or repel an assault. At the narrow gates, travelers could be stopped and questioned before letting them in. There is no more famous example of an ancient walled city than Jerusalem. Although today it is a bustling modern city with automobiles and electric lights, much of the old wall remains. Part of it belonged to the Temple of Solomon, and at this section, called the Wailing Wall, Jews stand to bemoan their departed glories. Time after time within these walls, the Jews from the greater part of Palestine would find refuge from the armies of Egypt and Assyria. One of the greatest of the ancient walled cities is Rome, built high up on seven hills beside the river Tiber. Upon these hills, a barbaric tribe erected a city fortress from which they marched to conquer first Italy and then 
the known world. The stronghold of the Emperor Hadrian, who flourished in the second century AD. Unassailable from the riverfront, despite the bridge. Protected on the land side by a remarkable system of ramparts and corner bastions. The Colosseum, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, so large that 90,000 Romans could gather there to watch the spectacles in the arena. And the great cathedral founded by St. Peter himself. storehouse of art treasures made by the masters of sculpture, painting, and mosaic. For centuries, reflecting the glory and carrying on the best traditions of the capital city of the world. cities are built upon mountains or walled in for defense. Here, upon an island in the Seine, early Gallic tribes settled to found a community which was to grow into the modern city of Paris. Standing upon a bridge, you may see the Aile de la City, as the French call it, with the River Seine flowing on both sides. On the island is the celebrated Cathedral of Notre Dame. From the side you can see one of its beautiful rose windows and the flying buttresses which add strength and beauty to the nave. Standing on the upper terraces, the modern city of Paris may be seen spreading out from the island in all directions. In the distance, clearly visible is the Eiffel Tower. Island cities have arisen still oftener in the sea. Venice. Bride of the Adriatic was built on islands for protection, islands so small that canals served for streets. We can imagine how secure these early builders must have been from the warlike land tribes sweeping down from the north as we glide in from the Adriatic along these picturesque waterways, listening to the ever-present song of the gondolier. <laughs> Solo, solo col tuo cuore, cosa fu per me l'amore, lo sa solo mamma mia, che mi strinse sul suo cuore quando lei mi abbandonò, spasimar di gelosia, non trovare più riposo ed aver negli occhi un viso che scordare non si può, amore, amore. Trama il cuore quanto si fa scuro, e l'anima si sparte in un sospiro amaro. There is another and very important reason for cities. As people raised more goods than they needed, they would send the surplus to be traded. So long caravans of camels would wind their way over mountain passes and down to valleys, to far lands. 
Sometimes even the broad backs of elephants were used. and marketplaces where trading could be carried on. So on the routes of transportation and especially where two or more roads converged, trading cities would be built. Traders would come to such cities as these to live, and artisans too, for skilled workmanship was just as important as the raising of raw materials. And so these trading cities became the logical place for the makers of tools and jewelry, cloth and garments, to establish their shops and workrooms. Between the civilizations of Europe and Asia, there is but a narrow neck or bridge of land. To this, all the trade routes from the east and west converge. And here grew up the city of Istanbul. In its day, the greatest and richest trading city in the world. We sail up the Bosphorus and across the Sea of Marmora to the bridge that crosses the Hellespont and unites the eastern with the western world. With the discovery of other routes to India and China, and with the opening of the Suez Canal, this city has lost much of its importance. But with the new and changing political alignments in Central Europe, who can tell what importance it may yet acquire? As it is much easier to float goods than to carry them, from earliest times rivers have been the great routes of travel. So for thousands of years clumsy junks have carried the products of central China down the Yellow River toward the sea. There where the sea and river unite to build the markets and the city of Canton. In the early days of our own country, it was down the rivers that the early trappers found their way to the trading posts. These trappers blazed the trail along which other pioneers were to follow. And these trading posts often selected choice locations where large cities like St. Louis, Pittsburgh, and Detroit afterwards were to be built. a moment at four great cities of the United States. On the west coast we select San Francisco, located by the Golden Gate, through whose portals flow so much of our trade to the Orient. From the Berkeley Hills we look across to the bay on the peninsula on which San Francisco is built. This thin line jutting out into the water marks the location of the San Francisco-Oakland Bridge, the longest in the world, which extends out from Oakland.
across Goat Island in the center of the bay, over the deeper channel of the harbor into San Francisco itself. San Francisco's Chinatown is a reminder that this city is at the gateway of the roads which lead from west to east. In this city a dime can buy flowers at Christmas time. To the south is New Orleans, one of the great river-built cities of the United States. A great wealth of grain, cattle, and cotton raised in the Mississippi Valley converges on the city like water in a funnel. Born southward along the Mississippi River and all its tributaries, this commerce comes into the neck of the funnel at New Orleans, the point where all this southbound traffic transships to ocean-going liners. The old cathedral and the quaint French Quarter remind us that commerce has made of New Orleans an important center long before this city had become a part of the United States. On the southern shore of Lake Michigan is the man-built city of Chicago. Nature has given it no special harbor privileges, nor a great river. It is a child of the railroads. The first railroad to the west passed through Buffalo to Chicago. Trains from the northwest passed around the tip of Lake Michigan into Chicago. The first railroad was built across to the Pacific from Chicago. And so Chicago has become the greatest railroad center and the second largest city in the United States. Its vast stockyards are just one evidence of the advantage Chicago enjoys as a center from which to distribute food or merchandise to all parts of the United States. And so along the shores of Lake Michigan has grown this great city with its magnificent Michigan Boulevard paralleling the beautiful lake shore. Now this canal is the Chicago River, which joins Lake Michigan with the Mississippi River. This great commerce building typifies the stability and wealth that the railroads have brought. And now we cross to the eastern coast, to the city of New York. It was only natural that all the resources within our country should find some eastern portal through which to pass to Europe. Long before the white man came, the Indians had discovered a trail down the Mohawk Valley along which they could pass through the Appalachian Mountains to the west. In the early days of the last century, the Erie Canal was opened along this route from Buffalo to the Hudson River. Even before that time, river steamers were sailing down the Hudson to its mouth, where was located the finest natural harbor on the Atlantic seaboard. And so as the West began to settle, an increasing stream of traffic began to come to New York City, the lowest and easiest passage between East and West. And New York leaped ahead in size and importance to become the largest and most important city in the Western Hemisphere. In and out of this harbor flows 60% of all the commerce between the United States and the rest of the world.
Good morning, wake up. We take our comforts and conveniences and do not think of where they come from. Back of the faucet are many miles of pipeline provided by the city to bring down millions of gallons of fresh, pure water each day. Through these sprays, the water is thoroughly mixed with the air before it comes to the kitchen for our use. As we study the story of this city, built of scenes gathered from many of the large cities in Europe and America, we shall see many other ways in which the city protects our health assures us security, and provides opportunity for mental and moral growth. Down the silent streets, the rubber-tired milk wagon is making ready the early morning deliveries so that fresh milk will be on hand for breakfast. Fresh and pure milk is an important problem in every great city. Here are the bottling stations and the pasteurizing plant where the milk is sterilized under the vigilant inspection of the health authorities. To these stations, great trucks are bringing fresh milk, sometimes from farms many miles away. At the newspaper office, the last edition of the morning paper is on its way out to the newsstand. In the wholesale district, trucks and wagons are arriving from the truck farms with fresh fruit and vegetables. These drivers left the farm long before the sun was up, but by the time they arrive in the wholesale district, the markets are astir. Among the early arrivals on the streets are the cleaners. Motorized sprinklers have their place, but there's nothing like a brush broom to keep the gutters clean. waterfront, the city comes to life as the sun comes over the horizon. The dredges are at work, for the harbors are continually filling up, and there is need that the water at the wharves be made deeper and deeper. Blunt-nosed tugs are pushing their way in and out among the shipping. The factories, too, are astir, for manufacturing, like transportation, gives work to many people. Now, workers are crowding the elevated lines above the surface. The buses on the streets. And the subways underground. Every means of transportation into the heart of the city is running to full capacity. while steam and electric railroad lines are bringing in the many people who live in the suburbs. A great army of nearly a million workers converges upon the business center of the city.
Is it any wonder then that great buildings tower 10, 20, 50, even 100 stories into the air to accommodate the largest number of offices upon the smallest space of ground? Modern trends are concentrating more and more business and people in great cities. And so, of the building of skyscrapers, there is no end. Deep down into the earth to find a firm foundation. upward into the very sky itself. These structural steel workers are a hardy breed of men, and noontime finds them all unconcerned hundreds of feet above the city pavement. hour, the lobbies are full of hurrying workers, each with an eye on the clock. Vast moving elevators shuttle back and forth between the street level and the highest floor, for the running of a great building is a business in itself. Offices, there is great activity, for if the city worker only works seven or eight hours a day, city life requires that during these hours he work with speed. This is the time of the morning when the thrifty housewife seeks bargains. This street display of carpet is typical of Paris, but the scene reminds us that even our most conventional department stores are essentially not very different from a primitive open-air market. Of all the merchandise sold in a great city, none is sold more feverishly than stocks and bonds. On the floor of the stock exchange, millions of dollars worth of securities change hands each day as the ticker taps out its record in an endeavor to keep pace with the movement of business.
The city is now fully awake, and on its streets, heavy streams of traffic weave in and out. of this traffic is an important problem for the city and a policeman who can be both firm and helpful has an important duty at the proper signal one may safely cross the street An autoist who fails to heed the signal or a foot passenger who fails to look may easily cause an accident. A city provided ambulance rushes the victim to one of many hospitals, free to those who cannot pay, and a moderate charge to those who can afford it. At noon, the office workers gather a breath of fresh air as they stroll along the sidewalks. Many beautiful hotels accommodate the thousands of visitors who are continually thronging the city on business or for pleasure. They too find homes here. Or in these beautiful and modern apartment houses. Here is an humble home for the very rich and very poor alike live in the heart of a great city. Because the houses are so close together, the city must take special care to protect the health of the children who live there with a free health examination. This home is maintained so that children who need it and whose parents cannot afford to pay can have rest, fresh air, and plenty of good wholesome food. So again, the city guards our health. In summer, street vendors sell cooling drinks, but the vigilant city health department protects the health of children and requires that the vendors serve their drinks in paper cups. Fire. This is the peril especially dangerous in large cities where houses are built so close together. At the first alarm, the city firefighters are on their way, for the city is ever on guard to protect us from this danger. This fire is in a school. The children march out as they have been trained to do. And though for a time the fire promises to be destructive, not one pupil is injured. The quick action of the firemen soon has the fire under complete control. A fire is often more serious in homes where they have no fire drills. And that people may know how to take care of themselves, there are public schools, museums, and lectures. After school, the city provides parks where children, as well as adults, may have the advantages of fresh air and friendship with nature, which children who live in the country enjoy all the time.
In the heat of summer, the city has both bathing beaches and swimming pools. And for the children who cannot go there, the city has ways of turning the hot streets into beaches and swimming pools. The city provides other pleasures. Perhaps they are not all as wholesome or as useful, but they are at least more thrilling. People who live the humdrum life of the city have to have thrills and adventures manufactured for them. But there is an end to both work and play. With the five o'clock hour, the tide of city workers turns back again toward home. All becomes dash and hurry to board a train or catch a bus. But with the bustle and confusion shut out by the four walls of home, Boys and girls who live in the city may find rest and happiness in normal living. Knowing that the city of today, unlike many cities of the long ago, is protecting them, keeping them in good health, and giving them every opportunity possible in so crowded a place to find advancement and happiness. Night comes on. The policeman walks his silent beat, and for most of us, Unmindful of its many services, the city is asleep once again.